Hello friends, I'm Dr. Namita Shreyan. Welcome to the Biology Forum. This is one place where we can discuss all the topics in biology, hence the tagline, let's discuss biology. I'll be dealing with different topics in biology in the form of lecture series, which will be put up in the different videos. If you want to clear your doubts and even concepts in some topics of biology, you can go through my lecture series. So let's begin to this forum with the first topic, which is an interesting and an important topic, the circulatory system, a very important topic for neat aspirants as well as students appearing for their boards. So the circulatory system. The circulatory system, the first thing that comes to our mind is what is needed to be circulated and why is the circulatory system so important? We need it for a very efficient mechanism in all the organisms and that is the mechanism of transportation. The transportation is an efficient mechanism for movement of more substances into and out of cells. Now simple organisms like your sponges or your sealanterates, that is your nadarians like hydra, have a very simple mechanism for this circulation. They circulate the water from their surroundings into their body cavities and the exchange is carried out. But complex organisms need or use special fluids within their bodies for this process of transportation. Now the question arises, why do we need to have this transportation system? Firstly, it is needed to provide oxygen to all the cells for the process of respiration. It is also needed to carry essential substances like your hormones, the chemical messengers in our body, the antibodies which help in our immune responses and even nutrients to the cells. These are after the process of digestion which are absorbed through the villi walls into the blood. They need to be carried to the various cells the most important among these is glucose, which is the substrate for the process of respiration. Transportation also is needed to remove the harmful wastes like carbon dioxide and even our nitrogenous wastes, which need to be excreted out of the body. They have to be removed from the cells and then they are transported through this mechanism. So the next thing that we need to know in this are the types of circulatory system. We have two major types of circulatory system, the open circulatory system and the closed circulatory system. Both the names are self-explanatory. When I talk of an open circulatory system, here the blood is pumped by the heart and it is drained into cavities or spaces which we call as sinuses. So here what happens is the cells are in direct contact with the fluid, the circulating fluid, that means they are bathed in it. That is why we call it as an open circulatory system. Whereas in a closed circulatory system, the blood after being pumped by the heart is carried by a closed system of blood vessels which form a kind of a network. And in this process, what happens is the cells are never in direct contact with the circulating fluid. Most of the times it is blood and whatever exchange happens across happens across the capillary walls. Open circulatory system is generally seen in arthropods. If you remember, the cockroach has an open circulatory system where the circulation is of hemolymph and even mollusks. Whereas closed circulatory system is seen in vertebrates and even annelids. The earthworm is an example of this. The open circulatory system doesn't prove to be much of an efficient mechanism because here the flow of blood cannot be regulated and it flows under less pressure. In closed circulatory, circulatory system, because it is flowing through channels to blood vessels, the flow of blood can be regulated and it definitely flows under more pressure. So it turns out to be a more efficient mechanism. This is the example here, if you can see an open circulatory system, the cells are in direct contact where the fluid is draining, so they are bathed in the circulating fluid. Whereas here, a network is formed near the cells, the tissues, they do not come in direct contact. The exchange takes place across the walls of the capillaries. 
Example here is grasshopper having an open circulatory system. Here you're having an annelide, that is the earthworm. Here is the pumping organ, which is flowing through the blood vessels. There's a network of the blood vessels, but it is within these blood vessels. So this is a closed circulatory system. Now we are going to discuss about the organisms with different heart types. Generally, what we know of in human beings is that we have four chambers in our heart, two atria, two ventricles. But is it the same in all the organisms? No. So let us see what are the differences. The fishes, that is spices, have a two-chambered heart. That is, they have one atrium and one ventricle. This kind of a heart is called as a venous heart. All amphibians and reptiles, I would like to add here in reptiles, crocodiles are an exception. All have these have a three chambered heart. So they have two atria and one ventricle. All the other birds, that is apes, mammals and crocodiles have a four chambered heart. That is, they have two atria and two ventricles. This is how you can see fish having just an atrium and a ventricle and you can see it is flowing through this and this is how it is connected the two chambered heart here two atria one ventricle three chambered here also three chambered and what you're having here is a four chambered heart in mammals okay. so now we are going to the human circulatory system which is what this lecture series is all about so the human circulatory system, if you see, consists of a pumping organ, which we call as the heart. Here we have it. We have the channels or the blood vessels like arteries, veins and capillaries and the circulating fluid, which circulates through this entire system and is pumped by the heart and that we have the blood and the lymph. So we'll be studying each of these in great detail in the following lecture series. human heart. The first thing that you need to know that the human heart is mesodermal in origin. Generally a question that can come out of the three germinal layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm and the endoderm, the heart is mesodermal in origin. Where is it located? It is located in the thoracic cavity, behind the ribs, between the two lungs. The apex is slightly shifted or tilted towards the left. The space where the heart is placed in the thoracic cavity is known as the mediastinum or the mediastinal space. What are the coverings of the heart? The heart is covered by a double walled membranous bag called the pericardium. Peri means around, cardium or cardia means the heart. So it is a covering which covers around the heart and it protects it. Now the outer covering of this is called the parietal pericardium and the inner covering which is quite close to the heart tissue is called the visceral pericardium. Between the two layers there is a space which we call as the pericardial cavity in which there is a fluid flowing called the pericardial fluid. Now this fluid keeps these two membranes separated and does not allow them to stick to each other. It also acts as a shock absorber and prevents any trauma to the heart by any kind of a mechanical injury by absorbing this shock. So it is a very, very protective fluid flowing around the heart. The heart, as we have already studied, because it is for mammals, the human heart is a four chambered heart. You have two smaller upper chambers called the atria they're also called as the receiving chambers because they're going to receive blood. Whereas you have two other larger lower chambers called the ventricles, which are also called as the pumping chambers of the heart. The interatrial septum is a thin muscular wall which separates the two atria. Why is this so? Because you have to remember the left and the right side of the heart carry different kinds of blood. The right side of the heart is carrying entirely deoxygenated or impure blood, whereas the left side of the heart contains the 
oxygenated or pure blood. Yes. So in order to see to it that the uh, oxygenated and the deoxygenated blood do not mix with each other, between the two atria too, you have a septum called the interatrial septum. Similarly, between the two ventricles, there is a thick wall separating them called the interventricular septum. We have to remember that since the atria are the receiving chambers, they are comparatively thin-walled because they just need to receive the blood and pass it on to the ventricles. But as the ventricles, because they are the pumping chambers, they need to have a lot of pressure and force to pump the blood. So they are generally more thicker-walled, especially the left ventricle, because it needs to pump the blood into the systemic circulation. Now, what is the function? It prevents the mixing of the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Similarly, just like the septum between the two atria and the two ventricles, we also have a septum separating the atria and the ventricles. There is an atrioventricular septum which separates the atria and the ventricles of each side. So we have the right atrioventricular septum which separates or it is a partition between the right atrium and the right ventricle and the left atrioventricular septum which separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. This is how the heart is, the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. This is the right atrioventricular septum. Here is a left atrioventricular septum. Now what we have to understand the septum needs to have an aperture because blood has to flow from the atria to the ventricles. So the right atrioventricular aperture is guarded by a valve which is having three muscular flaps or cusps which we call as the tricuspid valve. So it is having three cusps or three flaps so, and this will guard the aperture between the right atrium and the right ventricle. A valve allows blood to flow only in one direction, that is unidirectional flow of blood. Not only that, it will prevent the backflow of blood because the moment blood tries to move back from the ventricles to the atria, it will snap shut and prevent this blood from entering into the right atrium. The left atrioventricular aperture is guarded by a valve with two muscular flaps. So there in the right side, we had a tricuspid valve here we have a bicuspid or a mitral valve. The openings of the right ventricle and the left ventricle. From the right ventricle, we have the pulmonary artery existing, which, exiting, which moves towards the lungs. And from the left ventricle, we have the aorta, which carries the blood to the systemic circulation. So both these, the pulmonary artery and the aorta, have valves of their own to regulate the flow and prevent backflow of blood. They are uh, guarded by half moon shaped valves. So we call them as semi lunar valves. Now, the function of the valves in the heart is the valves of the heart allow flow of blood in one direction only, that is, they prevent backflow of blood. Very important to know that the heart is constantly pumping. So it is made up of muscle, which we call as the myocardium. Now the heart is made up of a very special kind of muscles. The third type of muscle tissue, if you remember, when we studied tissue, when we study tissues, we always talk of the cardiac muscle. The most important feature of the cardiac muscle is that it is branched, it is striated, it is involuntary in function. The myocardium or the muscle of the heart is involuntary. It needs to have its own rhythmic beat. It will not depend on anything else. It is not under our control. And also, it does not get fatigued easily, which is otherwise quite a common feature of our skeletal muscles. However, the entire muscle, you would say around 90 to 99% of the heart is made up of this cardiac muscle. A very small part of the cardiac muscle is a modified tissue. It is modified into a specialized tissue which we call as the nodal tissue. This is a very important feature which we will see why this is. This nodal tissue, one of them is called the sinoatrial node or the sound. 
which is located in the upper right corner of the right atrium, just where the superior vena cava enters into the right atrium, it is located there. It is called the pacemaker of the heart because the impulses sent by this particular node, the SA node, starts the rhythmic beating of the heart through its conducting system. After the SA node, we have the second node called the atrioventricular node. This is also called as the pace setter of the heart. It sets the pace, but the impulses with which impulses that the AV node gives off is not as fast as the SA node. So SA node is the pace maker of the heart. Where is the AV node located? It is located at the lower right corner of the right atrium, just near the atrioventricular septum. So this is how the conducting system of the heart is. The SA node is connected to the AV node by internodal pathways. We have three internodal pathways which connect the SA node to the AV node. So when the impulses go, it leads to contraction of the atria. Now the AV node is connected to the AV bundle, also called as a bundle of His. Now this bundle splits into the right and the left bundle branches. And each of these branches is finally connected to the Purkinje fibers. So what happens is from the SA node, the impulses travel through the internodal tracts to the AV node. From the AV node to the AV bundle or the bundle of His, it spreads to the right and left bundle branches and then it goes to the Purkinje fibers. Now the Purkinje fibers are ultimately spread all over the ventricular wall. So from the atrium, the contraction, wave of contraction spreads towards the ventricles and ultimately the ventricles also contract. So the pacemaker starts the impulse which spreads to the AV node and then to the bundle of His and then to Purkinje fibers. We say that our heart is myogenic in function that is it entirely has its own rhythm controlled by the muscles of the heart. Though it does have a neurogenic uh, action also there are nerves uh, supplying the heart too, but entirely it is the myogenic uh, function of the heart which makes it bre bre uh, beat with a particular rhythm. This is the conducting system. Here is the sinoatrial node, the internodal tracts. You have the anterior internodal tract, you have the middle internodal tract and the posterior internodal tract connected to the AV node, the pace setter. From there, you have the AV bundle, a bundle of His, splitting into the right and left bundle branches, ending in the Purkinje fiber. So you can see it is spread out over the whole cardiac muscle. Now we talk of the cardiac cycle, that is how the heart helps in circulating the blood in our body. So we have the three stages. It starts off with the diastole. So first you need to understand or come to terms with the uh, understanding of the terms called as the diastole and the systole. When you talk of a diastole, it talks of the relaxation phase, whereas systole refers to the contraction phase. So if I talk of an atrial systole, it means when the atria are contracting. A ventricular systole talks of a contraction of the ventricles and the diastole or the joint diastole talks of when both of them are in a state of relaxation. So when you talk of a joint diastole, this is when both the semilunar valves of the pulmonary artery and the aorta are closed. But you're seeing that there is flow of blood into the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle and left ventricle. This flow is continuing. Soon what will happen is the SA node will give out its impulse, the atrium will start contracting so that blood will flow with more force into the ventricles. The ventricles will start filling up. Once they are filled to capacity, the tricuspid and bicuspid valves both will close to prevent the backflow of blood into the atrium. Now the ventricles, when they are going into the systolic phase, the ventricular systole, that is the time when the semilunar valves of the pulmonary artery and the aorta are going to open and blood from the ventricles, that is deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle will flow into the pulmonary artery and 
oxygenated blood from the left ventricle will flow into the aorta. From the pulmonary artery, the oxygen, deoxygenated blood will flow into the lungs for oxygenation. Whereas through the aorta, oxygenated blood is going to flow through to the various arteries into the circulation. So this is the cardiac cycle that we talk about. What happens in a cardiac cycle? Around 5 liters of 5000 ml of blood is circulated per minute. We call this as the cardiac output. This entire duration of one cardiac cycle where it has all the three stages is 0 0.8 seconds. That means on an average in a minute you're having in 60 seconds you have this cardiac cycle occurring almost 70 to 72 times in a minute. We can imagine the efficiency of our heart muscle and that if we split up this 0.8 seconds the joint diastole is for 0 0.4 seconds, the atrial systole is for 0 0.1 seconds and the ventricular systole is for 0.3 seconds. This entirely works out to 0 0.8 seconds on an average. You must have seen a doctor whenever you visit a doctor or cardiologist, you will always see them using a stethoscope and listening to your heart, heartbeats. What are they listening? You get to see, you yourself also must have felt it when your heart is racing fast or you're feeling getting the palpitations. We get to hear these sounds. We call it as the lub dub sound. The first sound is the lub sound, which occurs when there's a closure of the tricuspid and bicuspid valves when the ventricles are about to go into systole. The second sound is the dub sound, which occurs during the closure of the semilunar valves. So both the heart sounds are when there is closure of the valves. First sound is during closure of the tricuspid and bicuspid valves. And the second sound is during the closure of the semilunar valves. The human circulation is called as a double circulation. Why is that so? If you remember the fishes, I have talked about only two chambers. There you have a single circulation. Whereas here we have a double circulation because the blood enters the heart twice. So we have two parts to the circulation. There is a pulmonary circulation, which is diverted towards the lung and back to the heart and the systemic circulation, which through the heart goes into the system and then back to the heart. So what happens is I will explain in detail. The, all the veins from the lower half of the body drain into a major vessel called the inferior vena cava and the veins from the upper half of the body drain into a vein called as the superior vena cava. So the superior and inferior vena cava both empty into the right atrium because it is a receiving chamber. From the right atrium, the blood flows into the right ventricle. The deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle flows through the pulmonary artery into the lungs because it needs to be oxygenated. The lungs are the place where exchange of gases takes place. Carbon dioxide is breathed out and oxygen that has breathed in and in the alveoli enters into the RBCs. So the oxygenated blood now or the pure blood will be carried by two pairs of pulmonary veins and they will come and pour it into the left atrium. The left atrium will receive this blood. From there it will flow into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle it flows into the aorta which is quite a thick vessel because it, it, it has to bear the pressure that the left ventricle is exerting on the blood. This blood flows to various arteries and capillaries into the systemic circulation. From there, again, they are collected and back to the heart. So what happens is the blood is entering the heart twice. So we call it as a double circulation. Now we'll talk of the electrocardiogram. It is an, a graphical representation of the electrical impulses flowing through the heart by the conducting system and what are the various changes that you get in the form of a graph. The electrocardiograph is the machine which records this activity and the electrocardiogram is actually this that you must have seen even the doctors going through this entire strip of paper that you get to see. It is made up of these three main components. You have the P wave, you have the QRS complex and the T wave. Now what is a P wave? The P wave is caused 
due to excitation or depolarization of the atria. This is when the atria are going to contract. The QRS complex is caused by depolarization of the ventricles. So when the ventricles are going into a stage of contraction, this is the time it gets represented in this QRS complex form. And the T wave is caused by repolarization of the ventricles, that is when the ventricles are going into a stage of relaxation. So altogether, this entire PQRST, that is the P wave, QRS complex and the T wave together represent our electrocardiogram. So what we get to see is how, if there are any changes in this, it will give us a fair idea of some disturbances in this impulses or the conducting system of the heart. Regulation of cardiac activity. Yes, heart, as I had mentioned earlier, is myogenic in function. However, there is a center, a neural center in the medulla oblongata, which moderates the cardiac activity. And that is through the autonomous nervous system. If you remember, the autonomic nervous system is made up of two components, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So whenever the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, it causes an increase in our heart rate. So here what happens is a neurotransmitter is released like adrenaline, which will start increasing our heart rate. This is a, a neurogenic control of the heart is in special conditions like whenever you're exposed to any emotional upheavals, stress or even exercise. That is a time when you need more heart. So that is a time when the neurogenic part comes into action, comes into play. The sympathetic nervous system will be activated at that time to increase the heart rate because all the, your muscles need more oxygen. So the heart needs to pump faster to supply this oxygen. When the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, it will cause a decrease in the heart rate, fall in the heart rate. So this is how there is a neurogenic control on the heart in special conditions. Otherwise, heart is entirely myogenic. That means even if there is some uh, disturbance in your uh, imbalance in the uh, nervous uh, control, the heart will continue beating. Only thing is the rhythmicity of the heartbeat will be a little uh, wavered. It will become a little arrhythmic. Otherwise, it is going to continue beating. It is not going to stop beating. Now we'll come to almost the conclusion of this chapter where we'll talk of disorders of circulation. First thing is high blood pressure also called as hypertension. So we know that the blood as it is flowing through the arteries and the blood vessels exerts pressure on the walls of the blood vessels. This is what we call as blood pressure and this pressure generally is in the normal range of 120 by 80 millimeters of mercury. If you know, you have ever visited a doctor, you must have seen the blood pressure when they uh, check your blood pressure. It is through a machine called as this Figmo manometer. So what is hypertension then? Persistently high blood pressure, blood pressure above 140 by 90 millimeters of mercury is called as hypertension. It can create some problems in your body. So you need to be aware of this. The second condition is coronary artery disease. This is due to a condition called as atherosclerosis. What happens is if a person is having a very fatty diet, lack of uh, exercise, is obese, then there is deposition of cholesterol and fats, which makes the lumen of the heart, uh, must, uh, the uh, arteries supplying the heart narrower. So what happens is less oxygen is supplied to the heart through the coronary arteries, and it leads to this coronary artery disease. Angina, yes. This is the pain felt when less oxygen reaches the heart muscle. So just like if you do not get your adequate supply of oxygen, you feel suffocated. The heart muscle too, when because of less amount of oxygen reaching it, tries to tell you, cry out that it is receiving less oxygen in the form of this pain, which we call as angina pectoris, which tells you that there is some underlying pathology or some problem that you have to look into. What is heart failure? When the heart does not pump blood effectively enough, it is also called as congestive heart failure because in this condition, you get to see congestion in the lungs as well. Cardiac arrest. This is when the heart stops beating. There is no further uh, sounds heard. There is no circulation. It will lead to death. Heart attack is when the heart muscle is damaged by inadequate supply of blood. 
So all these are interrelated. That is why we always say that exercise and uh, uh, proper diet and try to minimize the stress. All these are very important for a healthy heart. Hope you liked this lesson. We have talked about the heart in, uh, in great detail. I will be continuing my lecture series with uh, when I'll be talking about the blood vessels and also blood and lymph. So keep watching so that you can have an entire idea of the circulatory system. Thank you so much.